Good morning, everyone. We are live for another TSA Around the World webinar. We are so grateful for all the viewers who come in and join us week after week as we take you across the world to show how the Turtle Survival Alliance makes a positive impact for tortoises and freshwater turtles all over our globe. Now, I am really excited about today's webinar because one, it's on Madagascar, um, one of uh, the greatest biodiversity hotspots of the world, a country with uh, a high level of endemism, meaning the fauna and flora there can be found nowhere else on earth. Um, but more importantly, I am uh, excited to have Rick Hudson, president of the Turtle Survival Alliance, here with me live today. But not only that, we do have several of our TSA Madagascar staff members uh, who are live on the chat. So this is a great opportunity uh, for you all to ask questions about this program in Madagascar as we go through the slideshow. And both Rick, uh, myself, and the staff members in Madagascar uh, will be able to answer those questions. So it, it's a perfect storm of tortoise knowledge. Um, now, uh, one thing I do want to say first off is that there is the 18th Annual Symposium on the Conservation and Biology of Tortoises and Freshwater Turtles. This year is our first ever virtual experience uh, of this symposium due to the pandemic. And I've talked about this numerous times. Uh, we already had our abstract submission deadline and we received so many abstracts, which just shows us that this is going to be a truly global symposium. Uh, we're really, really excited. We're gonna get to see and hear from people who oftentimes are not able to come to our in-person destination symposium. So we're really excited. That will run uh, from the first week of August uh, through September 24th. Um, we may, right now we had set it up for August 6th to September 24th uh, with a, a session topic each Thursday. However, uh, we may alter that as uh, we draw closer um, as we look at the presentations that have been submitted. And again, thank you all uh, for, to those who have submitted and thank you in advance to all of those who will be in attendance. Uh, all of the sessions will be automatically uh, recorded and uploaded on our YouTube channel right here um, as are our webinars. So this is a rather long webinar today, just warning you. So you might want to get some sort of uh, uh, sleeping device, maybe a pillow, a headrest, some pajamas, and even a potent potable to get you through. But we hope to make it a very informative experience. I uh, just wanna look over to our sidebar really quick and just say uh, hello to everybody tuning in. Uh, lots of familiar names. Um, so you know what? Let's jump in to Madagascar. But before we do that, uh, I want to give you all uh, some resources that are available to you for not only this webinar, but other webinars. Um, our TSA YouTube channel. You're here on it right now. Uh, we have a multitude of videos, including past webinars, for you to go back and watch uh, and comment on. They're great to use for uh, educational resources, tools, and for those of you performing conservation or interested in performing future conservation initiatives, it's a great a platform to be able to start off, to get ideas, and in some cases, uh, not have to worry about uh, re, uh, re uh, building the wheel. Um, for this particular webinar uh, on, on Madagascar, there are three videos that I want to point you to 
on our YouTube channel. Those are Crisis in Madagascar, Remembering the Past, Focusing on the Future, Saving the Radiated Tortoise, and Tortoises in Trouble. Uh, the first two um, videos were uploaded in 2019, while Tortoises in Trouble is roughly a decade old, but uh, the subject material is just as relevant today as it was back then. All right, <laughs> Greg, he says, uh, I'm all comfy, ready to watch this. Good, get comfy. Uh, second, we do have magazine archives. If you don't know, the Turtle Survival Alliance publishes an annual magazine which details all of our and our uh, partners' work across the globe. This is published uh, at the end of each year. I have my 2019 magazine right here with this wonderful alligator snapping turtle on the cover. So we have a web and a uh, magazine archive link on our website homepage. So go to turtlesurvival.org, down to store, and then scroll to TSA Magazine Archives. All of those are past editions which are available for download for you to use as an educational resource. Lastly, if you want to get each year's annual magazine, you got to become a member. All right, so please, TSA memberships help make this organization run. Uh, we couldn't do what we do without the support of the community, including our members. So if you are a member, thank you very much. If you plan to become a member, thank you very much. And we look forward to sending our 2020 copy of Turtle Survival Magazine directly to your door at the end of this year. So stay tuned. All right. So let's jump into Madagascar. It is a country that most people have heard of, whether they've read about it in books, whether they are a biologist, an ecologist, or even just a uh, movie viewer. We all, uh, most of us know, should I say, that uh, they made a series of movies called Madagascar, in which a whole a uh, slew of African animals made their way to this island nation. All right, so Madagascar uh, was once part of this ancient continent known as Gonwanda. So um, you had Africa, you had Madagascar, you had India, you had uh, Asia and Australia um, and all lumped together in, in this ancient continent, Gondwanda. Uh, well, over the process of millions and millions of years, of course, a timetable that we cannot even fathom, um, Madagascar separated through plate tectonic movement from uh, continental Africa. And that happened around 150 to 180 million years ago. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that this country, uh, now isolated from the primary continent, de developed a high level of endemism of its flora and fauna. Species evolved there that can be found nowhere else on Earth. In fact, the endemism is uh, uh, so great that 80 to 90 percent of all species on the island are endemic. Uh, if you've ever got a chance to travel to Madagascar, you know how special this country is, what a hot spot for biodiversity, biodiversity it, it is, and what a long lasting impression it leaves on you. Uh, I know for myself, and I'm sure Rick Husson can attest to this, that uh, going to Madagascar um, is an experience that will forever be a part of you. And it also helps you uh, realize conservation uh, and social and economic issues on a global level. 
All right, but I know you all want to talk about turtles. So Madagascar has 15 taxa of turtle and tortoise. Uh, it has seven taxa of tortoise. And if you watched our webinars before, you know that taxa means species and subspecies. All of those are endemic to the island. Uh, there are three taxa of freshwater turtle. One of those uh, is endemic. And there are five taxa of marine turtle that uh, uh, either uh, enter the, uh, the ocean surrounding Madagascar or nest on its shores. Uh, something interesting that I do want to actually uh, interject here is that there were two species of giant tortoise that once lived on Madagascar. Uh, but since human inhabitation of the island approximately 2,000 years ago, both species of those giant tortoise have gone extinct. That's a little bit of foreshadowing because what we could consider the giant tortoises of Madaga Madagascar now are on a similar trajectory, and we're going to get to that. And our main focus uh, for today's webinar is to get you interested in the conservation efforts for the imperiled tortoises of this country so that we never see a tortoise species go extinct on this island nation again. All right. So, uh, Rick, do you have anything to add to that? No, you covered it. All right. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> All right. Let's look at the challenges of this country. When we think in terms of conservation, we have to take into account uh, the challenges that the country and the people of the country experience, uh, and then how those challenges affect the environment, um, its habitats, its ecosystems, and its biodiversity. So let's first look at the social and economic challenges in Madagascar. First off, this country is experiencing a rapidly growing uh, population. Uh, from uh, a lot of notes that I've seen, this country has the fastest growing population of humans under the age of 12 years old. 60% of this country's population are under the age of 25. 40% are under the age of 14. This means that we have a very, very wide bottom to our population bell curve. Uh, it means that we are going to continue to see exponential population growth in this country. And that has a far-reaching impact for uh, uh, social systems, for economics, and of course, for the conservation of the flora and fauna of Madagascar. All right, next, this is one of the poorest countries on earth. 78% of its population live in extreme poverty, uh, which uh, is provided by a baseline of uh, living off of less than $1.90, and that's in United States dollars per day. 97% uh, of the population live in poverty, which would equate to living on less than $5.50 per day. So again, you, when you think about conservation, when you think about deforestation, when you think about uh, the crises uh, involving this country's uh, wildlife and especially its tortoises, you have to think about and you cannot ignore these factors, uh, these factors of extreme poverty, these ex factors of the rapidly growing population. Uh, combined with that, there is political instability and corruption within the country, and that has uh, also far-reaching impacts on the people, um, their livelihoods, and conservation in the country. So let's also look at education. You know, I think for many of the people watching, 
especially if right now you are watching on a mobile device or on a laptop or on a uh, PC. Um, these, uh, we probably have all had access to at least some level of formal education. Um, here in Madagascar, and especially in the rural south where uh, most of our efforts for tortoise conservation take place, there are limited educational tools. Uh, the rural communities often have little access to schools. Um, for those who live in these rural communities, if there is a school in close proximity, it is often a distant walk um, I, have, I have heard accounts of students walking 20 kilometers per day to go to school, okay? That, that for, for any student of any age, that is a significant distance to be able to receive your education. So something I want to interject in there is that the TSA uh, has taken it as an initiative uh, in uh, collaboration with our programs for the tortoises to, in certain communities, build schools. Because uh, the more we educate, the more we provide the communities uh, with some central resource for education, the more we can work with those communities uh, for the persistence of these animals. Um, also, education can be a financial burden on families. So all that being said, it's a really sad stat, but over 1 million students drop out of primary school per year in the country of Madagascar. Um, all right, Brenda, thank you. She says, send me over there. I will be happy to teach. I am a teacher, college professor, and turtle lover. Uh, I, I think, uh, Brenda, maybe we need to uh, build a school and send you over to be the uh, the head instructor. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your uh, recognition of this issue and for your um, uh, <clears throat> yes, I just bumbled my words. You know why? Because I'm getting I'm getting a dry mouth really quick. Everybody who knows and watches my webinars know Coke Zero. It's always on hand. I'm still waiting for our sponsorship for tortoise conservation uh, from Coke Zero, but I'm sure it's coming soon. Rick, do you have anything to interject? Well, I want to reflect on the political instability issue in that how destabilizing that is for Madagascar's uh, conservation outlook. So much of um, Madagascar's conservation budget comes from external donors and international donors. And since I've been working there starting th probably 30 years ago, more presidents have reached office through a coup d'etat than they have elect, been elected. And every time there's a coup, international money dries up and that further destabilizes this thing and sets, sets us back. So um, it's a big factor. All right, thanks, Rick. Yeah, that's really important information. Um, I don't want to you know, uh, completely say that conservation is a first world problem, but when we look at all these challenges social and economic, we have, uh, we cannot ignore uh, the challenges within these countries. And I, I oftentimes hear people saying, well, why can't they do this? Or why can't they do that yeah. regarding certain areas and communities? And you really have to get to the root issues of why uh, 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 conservation is, is, is floundering in areas, why animals are being uh, poached, why animals are being consumed. There are a lot of factors behind there. And yeah, thank you very much, Rick, for highlighting that political instability. Uh, and Harry Lala uh, Rendria Mahazu uh, says, connectivity is unreliable here. I believe he's talking about the internet um, but, uh, but hopefully, uh, we'll be able to hear from Harry Lala Rendria Mahazu very soon. All right. So next challenges, environmental in the areas we work in, uh, the deep Southern region of the country, uh, there is severe drought and access to water as an environmental challenge. 
some of these regions experience multiple years of drought on end. Uh, I can tell you that uh, when we went to Madagascar in 2018 uh, to provide relief uh, for tortoises confiscated from a uh, smuggling operation, which we'll get to later, by the way, so you better stay here, don't fall asleep now, um, is that uh, down in Itampulu on the southwestern coast, uh, they had not received rainfall for three years. Okay, I, I myself living in uh, South Carolina uh, get antsy when we don't receive rainfall for two weeks. So just imagine the challenges associated with not receiving rainfall for multiple years on end. Uh, to add to that, uh, for the populace there, there is a significant time expenditure uh, to collect water from wells and from rivers. Uh, if you think about some of these communities who don't have adequate access to drinking water, um, it can be a full day's walk to and fro a water source just to collect water for cooking uh, and for, of course, drinking, uh, providing wa uh, fresh water for uh, livestock uh, and any potential crops that the people may be growing on their land. So another very, very daunting challenge. Uh, in rural areas, up to three quarters of the annual income of those living there uh, can be spent on drinking water. Okay, you and I at home, you know, we have to think about rent. We have to think about our bills. We have to think about our daily coffee run in the morning, which, uh, you know, we pay $7 for. Um, so it's very important for us, again, as conservationists from afar, uh, to think about those challenges, such as the fact that three quarters of an annual income is spent on obtaining water alone. All right, next thing I wanna talk about is invasive plant species. Now, uh, no matter where you are in the world, you are probably familiar with invasive species, especially in the form of plants. I know here in the United States, we have um, a, a never ending list of invasive species, many of which are causing problems for turtle populations, such as the giant reed Phragmites australis uh, for spotted uh, turtle, Blanding's turtle, and, uh, uh, and Dimeback terrapin populations. Uh, well, in Madagascar, uh, in arid regions, uh, uh, cactuses of the genre uh, Opuntia and agave uh, now dominate many of the habitats in those arid regions. Um, not only have they been introduced, but uh, the livestock that are commonly um, uh, kept uh, by the locals in rural Madagascar, goats, and cattle will routinely eat this opuntia, uh, defecate the seeds, thereby spreading it. So uh, I know seeing firsthand these areas, uh, it uh, dominates many of the landscapes. And then let's talk about deforestation. Um, it, 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 Rick can attest to this. And when I flew over parts of Madagascar and looked out the window, uh, I mean, I was stunned. I was, it was nothing I had ever seen before in my life. Uh, formerly forested areas now completely barren, except for uh, in the drainages of those areas uh, where some uh, of the forest, uh, whether it's uh, primary, uh, secondary, or even tertiary forest uh, still remains. But there has been a greater than 90% deforestation of the island since the arrival of humans about 2000 years ago. Um, much of this deforestation is predicated on slash and burn agriculture uh, for cash crops such as rice, cassava, corn, sweet potato, coffee, cloves, and vanilla, um, as well as livestock pasture land. Now, uh, regarding 
uh, deforestation or altering of the habitat for cropland and uh, livestock pasture land, uh, we in the rest of the world, um, we can't really comment uh, or make judgment regarding that. Um, I will tell you right now that in the uh, central United States, in the Great Plains, where there was once tall and short grass prairie, only 1% of that former ecosystem now remains. The rest has been converted to agricultural crops and livestock pasture land. So this is a problem all over the world. Um, and it's, it's a problem that we need to focus on how we can better integrate uh, cropland and uh, the main maintenance of livestock uh, within uh, habitats or restoration of habitats and corridors through that area for wildlife to at least persist and or move through. Uh, and then lastly, I wanna talk about charcoal harvesting. This is a, a large concern for our tortoises that live in Southern Madagascar. Uh, the, uh, the slash and burn practice of uh, burning the spiny and coastal scrub and Makia forests uh, to collect charcoal. Now, this uh, source of charcoal is uh, it's actually not a very good source of uh, charcoal. It's not an efficient fuel. So one of the uh, projects that uh, uh, those in Madagascar and uh, collaborators of the Turtle Survival Alliance have taken um, about uh, is to try to um, um, push the use of briquettes made from um, basically refuse items from uh, pasture land, from cropland uh, and other uh, uh, you know, um, substance crops to create uh, fuel for fire. Rick, anything to add there? Just very quickly, the uh, presence of the prickly pear or the Puntia cactus is kind of a double-edged sword. There are no less than seven species introduced, and it has a really devastating effect effect on on native plant ecosystems. But in areas where the, the native plants have been destroyed, a puntia takes over, and it really provides a, a refuge and a food source for radiated tortoises. So you'll see tortoises thriving in areas that are completely devoid of native vegetation, but they're subsisting on a puntia. And you know, it's not unusual to see a tortoise walking down the road with a, his mouth covered in red apuntia fruit. So um, it's kind of a double-edged sword. The, um, the other thing about the habitat destruction is that, that you'll notice in Madagascar is that you know, that everything is fragmented. And so wildlife exists in these little island patches. And so everything is fragmented. But when you get into those good habitats, the wildlife is so abundant and so diverse. It's, it's just, it's stunning. You can, it's just wildlife on demand. You can stand there and burn pictures all day and never move. It's just, it comes to you. It's an amazing place. See Absolutely. You. Yeah, I agree with you, Rick. Rick, we have uh, two questions from, uh, a very good friend of yours who uh, may be just peeking over your fence uh, in your backyard through your window right now from Texas Turtles. Um, sounds like a one Carl J. Franklin. Um, what, is, <laughs> what is the value of having the tortoises under federal regulation in the United States? Clearly, it doesn't slow down Asian poaching nor human consumption in Madagascar. The follow-up to that is, why can we not sulcata eyes, uh, by the way, that's in reference to the sulcata tortoise, the African spurthide tortoise, the radiated tortoises. Given the stark poverty in Madagascar, aren't some of the conservation attempts naive and akin to a new roof on a burning building? Don't, aren't you looking forward to uh, your next beer with uh, Carl? <laughs> there may not be, be another beer with Carl. No, that's that's a good question. And when the Endangered Species Act was written, there were a lot of species placed on there that uh, probably shouldn't have been. And when when the that act was written, the radiated tortoise was thought to be endangered. But it really, in real, reality, there were a lot more than people realized. 
Uh, the idea of, of putting radiated tortoises into commercial trade has been floated numerous times. And as long as these tortoises have no value to the locals, but, but um, you know, but there's a monetary value assigned to them, you know, they're going to, despite tradition or protective traditions, um, you know, it used to be just they would see a tortoise crossing the road. Now they see a dollar bill crossing the road. And, and in the face of poverty, they're going to pick that tortoise up and sell it to people that want to engage in, in, in trafficking. Um, how do we legalize it, the commercial aspect of that of radiated tortoises? There is a group testing some theories now in Madagascar, testing some systems of, of harvesting eggs and, and offspring that can be um, then considered farmed and sent to um, and exported. I don't know if that's going to work or not, um, but it's those ideas are being floated. I don't have all the answers on that, but it, it's come up a lot and it's met with a lot of resistance. But in, in, in light of what's going on today, um, we have to incentivize local communities to protect tortoises and um, seeing some economic benefit is one way to do that. And that also brings up a common you know, uh, question between conservation and preservation, whereas in conservation is the presence of that resource in its natural habitat. And so that's where uh, utilizing the communities to protect the tortoises and our programs there are vitally important to its conservation in nature. Uh, preservation more so re uh, uh, references that animal's existence on earth. So uh, if you captive breed radiated tortoises in great numbers, um, it would preserve the species on earth. Um, and, and that can both be seen as, you know, with tortoise lives living across the world, that can be seen as a positive. Um, then there's the flip side of that when we talk about the sulcata tortoise um, in that, uh, the sulcata tortoise is one of the most, if not the most, uh, captive bred and proliferated tortoises um, in the world. And um, when I talk to people about sulcata tortoises and I go, well, did you know that they are now uh, listed as a critically endangered species by the uh, uh, IUCN Tortoise and Freshwater Turtle Specialist Group, it blows their mind because they're like, well, everybody has sulcatas. So that's also where we just have to look at the difference between preservation, so sulcatas living in somebody's backyard, and conservation, the, 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 the conservation of this species and their habitats in their native place of origin. Um, all right. So a lot of people are interjecting here. We might have to have a whole entire webinar just based on this issue. Uh, Mark DD, Mark Dupuy des uh, from the great white North Canada. He's probably just out there playing street hockey right now since the ice is melted. Uh, but he said that they funded stole uh, solar stoves in Kenya to help replace charcoal production. So Awesome interjection there, Mark. Uh, by the way, everyone, Mark uh, has done a lot of work, conservation work in Kenya, as well as in his native province of Ontario. Uh, we have Scott's Exotics saying CWB permits need approved rapidly. Um, Harry Lala says we don't grow vanilla and cloves in southern part of Madagascar, but in the north, you're absolutely correct. Uh, I was going to get to that later in the webinar, how those are a northern crop. Um, so I, at the time, um, I was just referencing the crops that are cash crops for Madagascar as a whole. Uh, but excellent. Thank you very much, Harry Lala. Uh, Peter Paul, oh boy, we are about to... Carl Franklin, way, way to really uh, fuel the fire here. Okay. Peter Paul Van Dyke says... Salcataizing Sol has brought profit to the breeders in Arizona and elsewhere, but has done nothing to improve the status and conservation prospects of the species in the wild in sub-Saharan Africa. So yes, exactly. That's exactly what I was talking about. Uh, people own these animals in their backyards. They breed them. Uh, however, 
that has not uh, changed the trajectory for survival of this tortoise in its native range in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Ernst says, remember that in reality, unless poor communities see tortoises as something other than a meal for a family or a dollar bill, the challenge will remain on how to conserve. Uh, excellent statement there, Ernst. Uh, and uh, this is also something we're going to get to uh, a little later in the webinar regarding community involvement and community and cultural traditions regarding these tortoises. All right, we could talk about um, uh, how to uh, uh, disperse radiated tortoises all over the world uh, for two hours uh, or, or 16 all to itself, but in the interest of time, uh, I will move on to our next slide. So let's talk about the beginnings of at least TSA's involvement in Madagascar. Now, there were other groups that were already working in Madagascar for the conservation of its tortoises. Uh, so in January of 2008, a workshop was held in the capital city of Antananarivo concerning the threats to Madagascar's colonians. Uh, this was called Turtles on the Brink, a workshop on current status, conservation prioritization, and strategic action planning for Madagascar's tortoises and freshwater turtles. And this was initiated by the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's Tortoise and Freshwater Turtle Specialist Group. Um, at that same time, uh, the genre of Pyxis, the spider tortoises, and Astrochelys, the radiated and plowshare tortoises, were elevated to critically endangered status. All right. So we have, by the way, we have a lot of comments coming in um, uh, regarding that last topic. Uh, I almost, <laughs> I almost want to let you all just discuss it with each other because we do have a lot of slides to get through. But it, I mean, it is a topic that has been discussed and discussed and discussed, trying to figure out what we are going to do in the long run. And if, um, like you all have asked, the proliferation of these animals um, is one of the tools of their preservation. All right, so next, the beginnings. Uh, TSA had not yet developed our TSA Madagascar program at this time, but we began to uh, take um, uh, actions in the country uh, based on that 2008 meeting. One of those uh, was to uh, start prioritizing fundraising for the plowshare tortoise preservation through uh, project Anganuka. And by the way, the uh, plowshare tortoise in uh, Madagascar is referred to as the Anganuka. Uh, by the way, if you think, if you are in, uh, in North America and you think I'm saying these O's uh, oddly, it's because I am. Uh, the O in Malagasy is pronounced as an O, as in the, uh, the wonderful drink, Yuhu. Um, so, Part of Project Anganuka that the TSA was interested in investing in was the development of monitoring camps, better surveillance capacity, and improved communication networks near core tortoise areas of Bali Bay National Park to guard against the smuggling of these tortoises. By the way, we're going to talk more about plowshare tortoises in depth in just a couple minutes. Um, next, we wanted to help support the captive breeding facility for this tortoise at Ampejuru, uh, run by the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust. All right, next beginnings. Um, so although uh, nowadays uh, you very much see TSA heavily integrated with radiated tortoise conservation, and a lot of that is due to the rampant poaching of this species. Our beginnings in the country very much uh, were based on spider tortoise conservation uh, research and education. Uh, so 
Uh, we started a partnership with uh, SOPTOM, uh, which is a, a turtle and tortoise conservation group based out of France at their Village des Tortues in Ifati Mangili. Now, uh, uh, ding, ding, uh, this will show up later in the webinar in a big way. Uh, this facility served as the only reserve in Southwest Madagascar dedicated to receiving and maintaining tortoises confiscated from illicit trade. Uh, I've been there myself. Rick has been there. Uh, we can tell you it is a, it's a large facility. Uh, all of the tortoise paddocks are built into the native spiny forest so that for those confiscated animals, it gives them the most natural-like existence. Um, here at Village des Tortues, they hold colonies of common northern and spider, southern spider tortoises and radiated tortoises. Uh, and in fact, uh, this facility maintains the largest population of northern spider tortoise anywhere in the world. Uh, so therein, we got involved with this uh, project called Sukapila. And Sukapila uh, is a project whereby we invested in building new breeding enclosures for the spider tortoises as seen in the top picture. And by the way, uh, the man there on the left is Bernard DeVoe, who is the uh, uh, founder of uh, Soptom. Uh, and then next to him uh, is uh, uh, Jean-Claude, and he is one of the caretakers uh, and facility managers there at Village de, de Tortue. Uh, both wonderful gentlemen dedicated to the preservation of Madagascar's tortoises. Uh, lastly, and again, this will come up later in our webinar in a big way, is the TSA made an in investment to build an on-site veterinary clinic there at the Village des Tor de Tortues, therefore really solidifying our collaborative effort uh, for Madagascar's tortoises. Rick, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, you're, you're covering it. All right. Um, all right. So Harry Lala um, uh, says that tribes in southern Madagascar do not eat tortoises. For them, tortoises are taboo. However, intruders or cross uh, marriage with people from other tribes are eating tortoises and driving them to extinction. Uh, there is local extinction at a very small scale. Excellent. Thank you, Harry Lala. Uh, that is a part of the webinar that uh, we are going to get uh, to and focus on soon with, um, with Fadi, as well as the applica application of DINA. And I very much appreciate you bringing it up now uh, because it helps everybody on our webinar understand uh, from those there working on the ground. So speaking of Harry Lala, uh, let's talk about A Program is Born, TSA Madagascar. Uh, the focus of this is for the conservation of Madagascar's imperiled tortoise species. And if you look at those two bright, shining smiles on your right-hand side, we have Rick Hudson, who, by the way, is also uh, with us live here uh, on top. And then you have Harry, La Harry Lala Rendria Mahazu, uh, who not only is there in picture, but he is on the chat board live as well to be able to give you any additional information from our program. Uh, I do want to give uh, a big shout out to the current leadership of this program. If I mispronounce your name at all, um, I apologize, uh, but just know that we at the TSA, uh, we appreciate everything you do and that tortoise conservation in Madagascar could not and cannot be uh, what it is without uh, your efforts for this TSA Madagascar program. So again, we have Rick Hudson, the president of TSA. We have Harry Lala Rendria Mahazu, the director. We have Hanta uh, Rasu Anavu, uh, the administrative coordinator. 
by the way, when I start saying all these names, I know that Niaina is going to just be laughing at me. Um, we have Sylvan Mahazutahi, the law enforcement officer. We have Christo Griffin, the manager of the Tortoise Conservation Center. We have Jose Andrea Mampionununa, uh, the lead keeper at our headquarters. We have Rihanna Miatrika, uh, the lead keeper of the Tortoise Conservation Center. Rielsen, the lead keeper at our Lavavulu Tortoise Center. And Dani Andriana Arisua, uh, chief of construction. Um, so I know I stumbled through some of those, but again, Thank you all very much. All right, TSA Madagascar, our footprint of tortoise conservation across the country. And this is a chance where I'm going to give uh, Rick Hudson uh, an opportunity to speak about some of these. Uh, we have five centers across the country. We have our headquarters in Antenna Narivu. Uh, we have our Tortoise Conservation Center in uh, Tsiumbi in the Andrui region. We have Ampanihi uh, Tortoise Center in Ampanihi in the Atsimu Andrafana region. Uh, we have the Lavavulu Tortoise Center in Lavavulu, also in Atsimu Andrafana region. And finally, the Betuki Tortoise Center uh, in Betuki of Atsimu Andrafana region. Uh, so I wanna give Rick a chance to talk about um, this footprint to talk about the headquarters uh, and especially the Tortoise Conservation Center and how it has involved the communities there uh, in the preservation of this tortoise. Well, this program has been evolving over time. And, you know, when we started uh, working on addressing the, the poaching crisis, we started empowering and training people, building capacity to take care of complicated tortoises. Um, and that led to, uh, of course, an uptick or an increase in uh, the number of tortoises that were confiscated. And so we had no place to deal with those tortoises. So we immediately built uh, five uh, small triage centers for short term holding. And these were built in strategic locations where confiscations were occurring. So those little centers were able to receive tortoises and rehab tortoises and allow them to de-stress and get them feeding and rehydrated following confiscation. Then that led to the uh, construction of our Tortoise Conservation Center, which is really the linchpin of our whole confiscation to reintroduction strategy. And that's in the south near a, a town called Siombe. And that is a, a large center that was uh, the land was donated or leased to us by uh, five local communities, which we work very closely with. We provide the water. We provide jobs for the communities. We're getting ready to build a school in the community. Um, so we have a very close working relationship with the community that provided uh, the land for that. But that's where that's one of our of operations in the south, and it's where we're holding about 9,000 tortoises um, right now. The whole facility was designed to hold 3,000 initially, and we have been in an expansion mode ever since due to all the increase in confiscations. Um, our other major center uh, is on the left there is the Lava Vulu Tortoise Conservation Center, which sprung up in response to the 2018 big confiscation where 10,000 tortoises were, uh, over 10,000 were seized in Tulier. Uh, and they are, so we had to really build that center while tortoises were arriving. But today, two years later, that center is, is, it is amazing what has been achieved there. And it's a beautiful center with lots of infrastructure and staff quarters and gardens and it's just, it's an amazing operation. Um, a, lot, a lot of people that were there during the uh, 2018 confiscation, I'd loved, several of them have been back and have been amazed at all that's happened there. It's just a, it's a thriving community. We work closely with local communities. Um, and I think that's what gives us really helps protect tortoises in those areas. And lastly, I want to talk about our new headquarters in, um, in, in Tana. Uh, which is a capital city. And this has really consolidated all our operations under one roof. And this, this thanks to the very generous donations of one of our board members, we were able to buy this property and, and uh, renovate it um, uh, with uh, money from a Hong Kong foundation. Um, we now have 24 hour security there. Our tortoises, um, our tortoise collection that lives in Tana 
uh, is uh, it has been moved here. We've got offices for all our staff and, and room for some growth. Um, so anyway, we uh, our, our footprint's growing. Um, we have uh, we really got uh, become a very functional team there. I'm, I'm very proud of everything that Harry Lala has put together and bringing bringing this team together. Um, we, we've got a we've got uh, we're getting a lot of recognition now within the country as being the kind of the go to group for tortoise conservation. Absolutely. And, you know, I second just the, the work that the team does there across the different facilities is just inspiring. Um, whenever I talk to uh, our staff members there, I'm always just so impressed at their dedication. Uh, you know, it can be late at night, early in the morning, and they're there uh, ready to chat about tortoise conservation. So, um, they, they are making a difference for these animals. And unfortunately, we were going to be bringing uh, two teams to both of these tortoise conservation centers uh, in July and September of this year for these big tortoise roundups to process every tortoise, to weigh and measure everyone, make sure everybody had ID, properly ID'd. Uh, all that had to be postponed due to, due to the uh, pandemic. But uh, we'll get back to that hopefully, hopefully in 2021. And it's, it, it provides a lot, a lot of opportunity for people to see these centers, experience it, go there, work. And when we put out the call for volunteers, we were amazed of how many people uh, were coming and wanted to come from both Europe and the U.S. Uh, with institutional support. So it's going to be a transformative experience for all the people that come there, as you know, having having been there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, but uh, yeah, I know that uh, I, I think about that experience all the time. Uh, and so for those who will continue to be involved uh, with the uh, process um, of our confiscation to reintroduction strategy, uh, which by the way, stay here and stay tuned for, I know this is a long webinar, but it's such an important and complex and comprehensive project that we have to give it its due. Um, but I know for those people who will go there, uh, it's something that's going to stay with them for the rest of their life. And one thing I'd like to point out is that the, the Madagascar, Pro, TSA's Madagascar program is our largest and most comprehensive of all our programs. It has the largest numbers of staff, over 50, the largest budget. I mean, it's, and we are uh, with the current pandemic and the, a lot of our support for that program comes from the zoo community which right now most zoos uh, have been closed for a long time. are just starting to reopen, um, getting over staff layoffs. So we're, we, uh, we anticipate a very tight year uh, fiscally, uh, but I think they're, the interest in Madagascar is strong enough that uh, we will survive. Great, thank you, Rick. All right, so let's move on to the, our focal species uh, for TSA Madagascar. In the northern part of the country, we have the well-known plowshare tortoise, Astrocheles yenifora. Uh, down in uh, the southwestern uh, and southern part of the country, we have the spider tortoise, Taxa uh, pixis arachnoides subspecies. And then in that same general region, we have the radiated tortoise, Astrocheles radiata. As you will notice, all of these are critically endangered species. All right, so look, let's look at the primary threats for these animals. Uh, let's start with deforestation because, uh, you know, we often talk, talk about threats. You know, we'll talk about poaching as a big one, um, but deforestation is a major, major threat and it needs to be uh, one of, if not, the uh, uh, founding uh, action items for any conservation group because you can do everything you want to to conserve a species, uh, but without uh, conserving and preserving the habitats in which they reside, uh, a gap is left in the long-term uh, survival of that animal and its habitat. All right. So again, as we said before, there's been uh, 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 roughly uh, greater than 90 percent deforestation of the island as a whole since human arrival uh, nearly 2000 years ago. 
uh, slash and burn agriculture is very common throughout the country. Uh, in the southern part of the country, now where we uh, are moving to, uh, to talk about our tortoise conservation in the south, cassava, corn, and sweet potato are the major cash crops of those areas. Uh, livestock pasture land for uh, livestock such as zebu, which is a cow, uh, goats and pigs um, is very, very common. And then as we talked about before, uh, deforestation as a result of charcoal harvesting. Uh, another thing that we have to take into account for is uh, mining for uh, precious metals and minerals in the country, which leads not only to deforestation, uh, but it is it uh, predicates tortoise poaching, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, and then also, as we talked about earlier, with such a large and rapidly growing population, especially under the age of 14 years old, uh, the expansion of rural villages and rural uh, centers as well as the expansion of larger city, cent city centers uh, continues to threaten uh, the habitats and biodiversity of Madagascar. Anything to add there, Rick? No, sir. All right. So let's talk about poaching for consumption as a primary threat. That is a gruesome photo that you see there um, it's one of, you know, it's, it's, it's one photo of, of hundreds, if not thousands, that we've seen of the rampant poaching of radiated tortoises for consumption. And these are grizzly sites. Uh, you can ask Rick, you can ask uh, any of our TSA Madagascar staff who are watching and are available on the sidebar um, about what it is like to see one of these stashes of tortoise shells in person. Uh, I remember a couple years ago, a stash was found of approximately 5,000 adult tortoises slaughtered for their meat. Uh, so poaching for consumption predominantly affects radiated and spider tortoises. So despite the fact that the spider tortoise is a small species, they are still consumed. Um, tens of thousands of animals are slaughtered per year for subsistence and delicacy consumption. Uh, poaching is rampant across southern Madagascar. Uh, tortoises are consumed in extreme southwestern and southeastern urban centers, as well as in northern urban centers of the northern half of the country. We're gonna get a little more uh, in depth about that in just a minute. Uh, one of the things that we have to talk about is, is the radiated tortoise as a delicacy item, okay? Th there are some tribes in the South who do consume this tortoise for subsistence. Uh, there are also um, uh, infiltrators into the uh, Southern spiny forests whether it be for logging or for mining or specifically for poaching, who will also eat these tortoises. Uh, but in major urban centers and especially in the north, this species is regarded as a delicacy. So just think about going to uh, a, a seafood restaurant and instead of ordering salmon, uh, you order the, uh, the wild caught cutthroat trout. Okay, uh, uh, oftentimes uh, these uh, Atlantic salmon are, are, are commonly found on menus uh, across the world, uh, but now instead you want a taste of that wild caught cutthroat trout. Uh, this is just a, a simple analogy uh, to show that these animals are delicacy items on menus, and so they are oftentimes preferred over uh, livestock or poultry uh, regarding food consumption. Um, it's also heavily influenced by poverty. We've already talked about the poverty levels of the country. 78% of the country 
um, uh, exist on less than a dollar and 90 cents per day. 97% of the country uh, exist on less than $5.50 per day. So again, it's difficult to make judgments about people, communities, and uh, cultures uh, when, uh, when just feeding one's family, just feeding, uh, just uh, uh, be able to provide drinking water for one's family is the priority of the day and every day. Um, and then also, as I talked about, the secondary effect of timber and mining operations. Um, uh, people from other areas, uh, especially of other cultures, coming into the ranges of these animals, not respecting the local traditions and customs there, and basically living off the tortoises while they um, uh, uh, are involved in the mining and timber harvesting operations. Um, if, if you can imagine, uh, take a whole group of uh, uh, timber harvesters, maybe 20, maybe 30, maybe even 100 men setting up camp in these forests um, and then having the tortoise as a readily available food supply. Um, this is a situation which is observed uh, with frequency and can rapidly lead to the extirpation of local tortoise populations. Rick, would you like to add anything? Well, I'll just say that when, when you encounter one of these massive tortoise slaughter sites, it's it's something you really never get used to. And it's, it's kind of a sickening feeling and you're kind of stunned into silence. And uh, you just get this profound sense of loss. You look at some of these tortoise shells that are, you know, animals that are huge and over, you know, we're over 50 or 60 years old. And you, you just get this sense of loss that these timeless gentle creatures are being, you know, slaughtered like this. It's, it's, um, it's a pretty sobering uh, impact. And um, I think anybody that sees it, it will steal their resolve to, uh, to help save the species. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to bring up is a couple people asked about regarding the rapidly growing population under 12 years old is what about family planning uh, in Madagascar? Uh, Harry Lala uh, responded with family planning is an interesting idea for the South. But one thing is that children are considered as the most important wealth. And this is commonly seen um, across um, developing countries and areas of uh, um, uh, great poverty, is that uh, the people of these areas have little uh, to, to show as far as uh, uh, commodities, uh, as items, um, as... About the, uh, in, the, in the South, zebus are kind of your bank. That's your currency. And, and, I, and I hate to be crass when I say this, but he who dies with the most zebu wins. And the more children you have, the more zebu you can manage. And if you have 12 kids, you can herd and manage a lot more goats and zebu. So there's really no incentive to curtail family size. They, they see families as you know, large families is increasing their capacity to manage zebu, and zebus are. Um, I mean, when when people die, they fa their family will take a significant portion of their zebu herd, sell it off, and build them this elaborate tomb. So you know, the afterlife is more important than the present life. And so, you know, these people may live in poverty their whole life, but they have this spectacular, you know, above ground tomb with these intricately carved. Um, Wood, wood freezes and, and it's, it's just um, it, it's it's something that we can't quite understand but that's that's the reality of the situation in the south right and a reality that has to be taken into account when trying to develop conservation actions uh, for the communities and the animals that live in and amongst them yep. um, uh, Dick vote uh, says why not promote fake news how tortoise meat leads to impotence impotency and cancer of the thyroid. 
Uh, he says China did it and it worked. So uh, we know in many cultures that um, that certain animal species uh, have uh, are, are believed to have medicinal uh, or other properties. Um, and this is through, you know, uh, millennia of, of passed down uh, knowledge uh, regarding beliefs uh, that cultures have towards certain animal species. This has been greatly exacerbated in the uh, uh, 20, uh, 20th and 21st centuries. Um, and yeah, so that that is a potentially an idea is that you plant the seed that certain species uh, in, in, instead of, of causing these uh, great relief, these great uh, um, medicinal values for people instead are something that you would not want to eat because they could lead to uh, negative consequences such as impotency. Anything to add there, Rick? No, it, it, but it's, you know, it's not really the impoverished local communities that are eating these tortoises. It's, 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 the, the trade is driven largely by poverty because local communities that traditionally protected or had a protective taboo against harming tortoises kind of relax that in the face of poverty and will let other poaching villages or tribes come in and take the tortoises. They're not going to harm them themselves, but they'll turn a, they'll, they'll turn away and, 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 you know, take some money to allow these people to work in their community forest. Um, the, the consumption is is not by impoverished people it's it's by people traveling through the region catholic the catholic relief ministries has been in numerous times cited as you know there are people stopping in restaurants and ordering tortoise um i mean it's 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 not starving people eating tortoises it's people right. can, that should know better and can afford other forms of meat right it's a luxury item right uh, yes, m much like uh, ordering a bowl of uh, tiger penis soup in a Chinese market, uh, much like um, uh, getting ground pangolin scales to, uh, you know, cure lymphoma or something like that, um, uh, paying high dollar for uh, what's believed to be a delicacy uh, that in, in some areas is believed to provide uh, substantial uh, human health benefits. Yep. Um, Mark Dupuy Desormeau uh, interjects that uh, the, uh, with relation to the owning of zebu and family size is that uh, the size of herds is always viewed as currency in northern Kenya. So we are focusing our efforts there on educating girls as the boys are usually tasked with keeping the herds. So uh, uh, boys watch over the herds uh, while they focus on uh, the women becoming educated. Really interesting. Thank you very much for adding that in, Mark. Love it. All right, next, let's go on to one that we all know very well, which is uh, poaching for illicit trade as a primary threat. Uh, this affects all of the species that we work with in Madagascar. Um, it predominantly affects radiated plowshare and the spider tortoises, uh, but the Madagascan hingeback tortoise, Canixis zambensis damarguii, uh, occasionally uh, is collected for trade, and we do have a colony of that species. It's a little-known species, um, at our Antana Narivu headquarters. Um, all of these species are protected from collection and domestic and international trade by Madagascan law, um, and all are uh, regulated at the international trade level by CITES, uh, which is the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna. All right, uh, next, uh, collection and trade involves highly organized poaching networks. Okay, you can, you must equate uh, a poaching of wildlife and the wildlife black market 
to the drug trade, uh, to the arms, large arms trade, or other um, criminal um, uh, syndicates. Uh, these are highly organized. Uh, they, um, they are organized in such a fashion that there are, um, it's basically a top-down uh, pyramid uh, where you have those uh, uh, fueling the trade at the highest levels, um, especially those who are very wealthy. And then eventually at the bottom of the pyramid, you have those, the impoverished people of Madagascar who collect the tortoises. Now, those who collect the tortoises uh, will receive a mere fraction of what that tortoise or turtle will eventually sell for um, in the international trade. So again, this, this insidious trade, uh, as I will say it, it preys upon uh, these impoverished communities uh, to fuel um, monetary wealth gain uh, for a small number of individuals at the top of the pyramid. Um, but there is also corruption within high-ranking government officials and gendarmes. Um, and again, like I just said, these syndicates use the destitute poverty of rural areas to their advantage. Rick, anything to add on here? Well, the TSA does a lot of enforcement activity in the South, and we have brought a lot of poachers to justice and brought them to seen it, seen that they were arrested and confiscated a lot of tortoises. But we're, we're primarily dealing with the symptoms and not the drivers of this trade. And in the coming years, uh, we need to start focusing at the judicial level and improving enforce, enforcement capacity, improving consistency in the judicial process. Um, we've, we've got to trace these poaching routes back to the drivers, and those generally are are wealthy um, wealthy people in the large uh, large cities that are pushing this trade. And that's that's where we need to turn our attention. We've got to you know we've got to start focusing on the drivers of the trade. Right. Um, and then so uh, adding to that. Um, Tens of thousands of tortoises are collected annually for export to international markets. Uh, this is a big part of our TSA Madagascar program is receiving uh, these uh, confiscated shipments of animals, uh, but we well, uh, giving them uh, triage and re rehabilitation and then providing long-term care for them. Uh, the sad fact of the matter is that even though our law enforcement network has in increased in the country, is that uh, what we're seeing confiscation-wise is still just a fraction of what is actually leaving the country on an annual basis. Um, now, as you can see in the photos there, juveniles are the ones primarily targeted for international trade. Uh, they are small, and you can fit more of them into a, um, a, a smuggling device, such as a box, a suitcase, or a crate, uh, and then sell them at a high dollar value in their final market of destination. So basically, it is more bang for the buck, um, more tortoises at any one given time. Uh, the other thing about it is that if you have 1,000 juvenile tortoises spread amongst 10 uh, smuggling uh, uh, devices, if two of those get confiscated and eight make it through, uh, there are still uh, enough tortoises for those syndicates to be able to profit off of these enterprises. Um, and that being said, bands of poachers can rapidly wipe out the tortoise populations in any given area. Um, smuggling efforts, as Rick was just talking about, smuggling efforts and trade routes are dynamic. And that's why it is so important to continually be vigilant regarding law enforcement uh, and regarding intelligence gathering. 
uh, because new methods and avenues are developed in response to law enforcement activities. Many of you have seen pictures of how wildlife is smuggled and the inhumane ways that are devised to do such a thing. Um, the primary destination for the dispersal of the smuggled tortoises from Madagascar is Southeast Asia. Historically, Bangkok, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, Jakarta, Indonesia, and Hong Kong, China. Um, from there, they are sold in markets uh, in those major cities or are dispersed uh, to other international marketplaces, um, uh, thereby proliferating the trade to a global level. Rick, do you have anything to add there? Well, it was just, you know, 10 years ago, the radiated tortoise, especially juveniles, was considered the most widely trafficked tortoise in the world, you know, right up there with uh, Indian star tortoises. And you'd go to the Chattachak market in Bangkok and they were just on for sale everywhere, highly visible. That trade's kind of gone underground now, but uh, they were highly trafficked uh, some years ago. And the sad thing about, you know, the poachers coming through and taking adults for the food trade for consumption and the juveniles for the pet trade is it it deals a, a really heavy one two punch to a population. I mean, if you take the adults out there's and and then take the juveniles out, you leave no potential for recovery. So um, it's it's devastating that and it, it's easy to see how these these uh, populations are wiped out by taking juveniles and adults. Right. Uh, by the way, we have some wonderful commentary uh, going on on the chat board. For all of you watching, please pay attention to that chat board because we have some of the world's best turtle biologists uh, uh, having conversations right now. And this is a great opportunity for you to learn in real time or be able to go back later into the webinar uh, archived on our TSA YouTube channel and go back and look at those conservation um, discussions. And the reason I say that is it's not only a chance to learn, but for those of you involved in conservation programs, by, by, by reading these and looking at these issues that I'm seeing talked about right now, it can help you formulate uh, or adapt your conservation actions uh, for whether it be a habitat, an ecosystem, or species that reside in it. All right, next, let's go on to some of these tortoise species. So the plowshare tortoise, uh, a very, very well-known tortoise, unfortunately considered uh, the most endangered tortoise species in the world. Now, um, uh, aside from uh, the three species of spider, uh, excuse me, three spe subspecies of spider tortoise and radiated tortoise that we work with in the south and the Madagascan hingeback tortoise up in the far north. Uh, this is the other uh, tortoise of northern Madagascar. And in the country, the Malagasy called the Ang Angonuka. Uh, it is critically endangered and it's estimated wild population is less than 100 individuals, uh, rendering it uh, functionally extinct or ecologically extinct across the landscape. Now, one thing I do want to say, and I may get uh, some uh, ch uh, chatter on, on the other side of this board here, is that I have seen various numbers used over the years for how many plowshare tortoises are left, okay? Their range is strictly reserved to fragmented sub subpopulations of Bali Bay National Park. Several years ago, their wild population was estimated to be 600. About uh, two years later, it was believed to have been halved to 300. And since then, there has been uh, almost an annual halving of those numbers. Uh, now I have seen anywhere from 50 to 100 remaining animals estimated in the wild. Either way, this tortoise uh, is on the fast track 
to biological extinction in the wild, um, now being one step behind that as functionally extinct. And functionally extinct means that although there are still uh, tortoises on the landscape, uh, their ability to come together uh, to reproduce and to provide a functional role uh, in and for the ecosystem is basically non-existent and non-existent for the future of that ecosystem. Um, and the drastic population declines of this species have been as a result of poaching for the international black market trade, uh, as well as it's compounded by bushfires in this very, very arid area of Northwestern Madagascar. Um, one thing I do wanna bring up that uh, Scott's Exotics just said is that it's insane. On Instagram, you can find people in Asia with plowshares, radiateds, and stars as pets. And yes, this is something that I see routinely uh, out of Instagram accounts uh, from Southeast Asia, uh, prim primarily Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, and China is uh, juvenile plowshares uh, that uh, appear to be wild caught and smuggled individuals, as well as radiated tortoises, star tortoises, and others you've mentioned, um, very visible in markets and captive collections. So we know that animals are still being collected and smuggled out. Uh, that being said, there are breeding operations uh, for all of those species, some of them legal, some of them illegal. Uh, so there are a certain number of captive bred offspring produced of all of those taxa which enter the international marketplace. Uh, now, that being said, uh, all of them are regulated at uh, CITES Appendix 1. Uh, and so uh, that it, it gives strict uh, prohibitions for their trade across international boundaries uh, unless there are um, uh, immediate uh, scientific uh, or uh, law enforcement um, uh, needs to move those animals. Uh, Rick, do you want to interject anything there about the plowshare tortoise? Uh, briefly, uh, I think when the epitaph on this species is written, the conservation community is going to be judged fairly harshly in that we fail to recognize the, the poaching threat or the severity of the poaching threat fast enough, and we didn't mobilize resources. You know, on the other, the flip side of that is that with, with the price being so high, the price on these on their heads being as high as it is, and with corruption and poverty being what it is in, in, in that, in that part of Madagascar. Um, it's, it's a, it's a very difficult species to protect. Uh, there is, you know, you, you talk about the economy of extinction and the rarer something gets, the more expensive it gets. And the more expensive it gets, the more people want to engage in trade. So you've got this economy of extinction that kind of sends this spe species down a spiraling down an extinction vortex. And that's what we're seeing right now. I think, uh, we, we've got to to really develop strong uh, captive breeding populations in multiple sites if we're going to save this species. Right, and and that goes very much along with what Peter Paul is saying over here. Uh, very few animals are left behind in the wild. Uh, most known plowshares uh, are now or have been evacuated to safekeeping in fortified facilities. Uh, so they don't count as animals in the wild, but they are still part of the conservation efforts. Uh, so yes, absolutely. Um, uh, the, the future of this species, as we talk about on the next slide, is, uh, is dependent on multiple, because you never want all eggs in one basket scenario, well-managed captive breeding conservation centers. Um, so Sean Chu says there is ethical captive breeding of Astro Kelly's radiata for the pet trade in parts of Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia. And uh, yes, uh, again, like I was talking about, uh, the radiated tortoise is 
uh, commonly bred uh, in many countries throughout the world. And uh, the distribution of those species is regulated by CITES Appendix 1, as well as by um, the uh, Protection Acts for Wildlife uh, as instituted by those countries of origin. Um, so next, plowshare action. So the TSA maintains an assurance colony of plowshare tortoises at a highly secure facility in the country's south. Uh, we receive, treat, and rehabilitate specimens confiscated from illicit trade at our Antana Narivu headquarters. Um, and in the program's origins, as I talked about at the beginning of this webinar, the TSA committed funds to Project Anganuka uh, and the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust breeding facility in Ampejurua. Um, Rick, I, I think you could probably say that uh, for the plowshare tortoise in Madagascar, uh, the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust uh, has done uh, the most uh, for this species in the country and uh, their captive breeding initiative. Yeah, they've been working on that species since 1986 and, and certainly perfected the uh, captive breeding techniques. Um, we just need to spread that uh, that population out into multiple multiple areas. The, the, the big theft there back in the early 90s, um, I think really underscored the need for one full-time protection by gendarmes and you know really strong security. And, and I wanna just reiterate that uh, the, the Hong Kong Foundation that helped us build our plowshare facility uh, we spared no expense, um, or they spared no expense in helping us um, put in really secure um, security measures, alarms, lights, motion detectors. I mean, it's it's all there. And and we and the TSA has contracted uh, the Global Security Forum uh, G4S uh, to uh, to train our. Um, our guardians of the tortoises uh, in, in defense uh, and security tactics. Yep. Um, all right. Next, let's now move on to the deep south. I told you this was going to be a long webinar, but let me tell you one thing. Madagascar and the tortoises of Madagascar and their future depend on it. So, and they deserve it. So, the deep south, the land of the tortoises. So the entirety of the ranges of radiated and spider tortoises are within the regions of uh, Andrui, Anusi, and Atsimu Andrafana. Um, you can see uh, the graphic there showing these regions in the south. Uh, the habitat uh, of these regions are characterized by spiny forests, coastal scrub, and in the northwest uh, corner of Atsimu Andrafana, the Mekia forest. Uh, this is an extremely arid region, um, and uh, the very, very southern um, part of the country is uh, highly windswept, and the coastal scrub uh, and the animals that live there, such as the tortoises, must endure very harsh conditions. Uh, to add to that, uh, some regions do not experience rainfall uh, for multiple years at a time. Um, now I want to talk about what Harry Lala uh, had brought up, and that has to do with ethnic groups and some of the cultures uh, there in southern Madagascar. All right, so regions of tortoise inhabita inhabitation uh, are comprised of four ethnic groups. The Antandrui, Antanusi, Mahafali, and Sakalava. So the, uh, the Antanusi is in the far right corner of Anusi. Uh, the Antandrui uh, is uh, across uh, some of the Andrui and Anusi uh, regions. Uh, and, and then the Mahafali. Uh, is within the Atsimu Andrafana uh, as part uh, as well as part, a small part of the Andrui region. And then you have the Sakalava, 
uh, which uh, inhabit very northwestern Atsimu and Drafana, uh, as well as the region to the north. And of course, uh, uh, Harry Lala or any of our TSA Madagascar staff members uh, who are watching and commenting, feel free to make any comments or corrections on that if you heard or saw any. All right, so let's talk about FADI, a traditional protection for the tortoises. So if you look at the infographic I've made, uh, it first illustrates Southern Madagascar, which is then overlaid by the three regions uh, at Simu Andrafana, um, uh, Andrui, uh, uh, um, excuse, excuse me, yeah, Andrui and Anusi that we just talked about. Uh, but then that is overlaid uh, by two cultures, two tribes, the Mahafali and the Tandrui. And what's important about these two cultures is that they have a custom that touching, harming, collecting, or consuming of the tortoises is taboo. It is forbidden. Um, the Tandrui and Mahafali have practiced this fatty for centuries. This, uh, however, this custom encompasses only a portion of the range of the tortoises of southern and southwestern Madagascar. And uh, as we talked about before, that leaves some parts of their range um, uh, open to threat from other tribes, ethnic groups, and people coming from other areas uh, who do not respect the customs of the Mahafali and Tanjui. Um, unfortunately, even in these areas, uh, the cultural custom of Fadi is seeing degradation. Uh, much of that is due to rapid westernization of traditional societies. Uh, and as I said, outsiders not respecting the traditional customs of the re region. Uh, but this Fadi is so important to the long-term preservation of the radiated and spider tortoises. Uh, it must be an observed, but not only that, reinvigorated in these regions and then strengthened uh, through community programs, uh, through uh, the TSAs and other uh, nonprofits and NGOs work uh, with and within these communities uh, so that the future of the tortoises uh, remains intact. Uh, and I will let Rick uh, uh, interject here about the Fadi uh, as he uh, knows this custom quite well. Well, if you look at the distribution of the tortoise and the fact that there's the Fadi is for, the, the protective taboo exists amongst the tribes, the Mopali and the, and the Tendrui, that's it's no secret that that's where these, these tortoises still existed, formerly existed in such high densities. And in the, in the surrounding areas that were part of their historic reigns, they are literally gone. And that's why the tribes that are in those areas are coming into the core, core areas uh, and, and taking tortoises. Uh, but, you know, when you, you you rarely see this anymore, but I can remember the times or early visits to Madagascar, you, you would get into areas that where the tortoise abundance was just stunning. And, you know, you're seeing uh, the pristine condition and just realizing that amazing densities these, that these tortoises can exist at. Um, and you don't see that anymore. You don't see the large adults like we used to see uh, very, very often. Uh, but it's it's the, it, that protective custom that has kept that species uh, alive today at such robust numbers. But what we're seeing now is 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 the, 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 the reason the radiated tortoise was elevated to critically endangered is is the the stunning rapid decline of the species. I mean, it's, it's the rate of decline that is really terrifying. When you see how fast they are going and how many are being poached, that's why it was elevated to critically endangered. All right, thanks, Rick. Um, so next, let's look at the cute, the beautiful, but the critically endangered spider tortoise. Uh, so this is known as Sukubatu, or uh, Sukupila in Malagasy. 
It is critically endangered. There are th three subspecies occupying a, um, a very narrow coastal range. Uh, these are the northern, uh, which is Pyxis arachnoides rigui, the common Pyxis arachnoides arachnoides, and the southern Pyxis, Pyxis arachnoides oblonga. And if you take a look at that coastal range in yellow on the map, you will see where this range uh, overlaps uh, with the regions we've talked about, as well as the uh, cultures of the Mahafali and Tanjui. Uh, now, one thing I wanna say about this range is that this depicts an, a, uh, a, an extensive continuous range. However, for these critically endangered species, uh, those range maps are not actually an accurate on the ground uh, um, current view of their fragmented populations. So they've seen a uh, population decrease due to deforestation uh, for charcoal harvesting, slash and burn agriculture, uh, and livestock conversion and collection for the food and pet trades. Um, the, so the spider tortoises are still collected for the pet trades, but at a, a uh, far smaller amount than they once were. They were once heavily collected uh, for the pet trades, especially in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Um, now, um, they are most commonly collected for the pet trade uh, when they are mistaken for radiated tortoises as the two tortoises do overlap. Or they are collected just as a surplus item when poachers are collecting radiated tortoises. Uh, I know when we see our uh, confiscated shipments uh, come through the Antana Narivu headquarters, that you will oftentimes have large groups of radiated tortoises with uh, one or more uh, spider tortoises kind of hidden amongst them. And again, uh, this is due to the fact that for much of their range, they occupy the same area. So there is still some monetary value for the spider tortoise. Uh, the other thing to remember is that this tortoise too is eaten um, by uh, certain tribes in Madagascar. Um, so John Kim asks, no planicauda. So the TSA does not directly work with uh, Pyxis planicauda, the flat-tailed tortoise. However, uh, our partners uh, at, at many different zoological institutions, notably Zoo Knoxville, uh, do work with Pyxis planicauda. Um, Rick might be able to interject some more information there regarding uh, that species of dwarf tortoise. Uh, right after I tell you that the continuous range, as I was talking about, of, the, of all subspecies are now highly fragmented. Uh, the spider tortoise has seen a 70% contraction of its historical range due to the threats we've talked about. Uh, so, Rick, what else do you have to add about the spider tortoise? Because this species uh, of tortoise was very much um, uh, a catalyst for beginning TSA Madagascar and some of the early work that TSA supported uh, regarding uh, site surveys and comprehensive population uh, and habitat assessments. Uh, and then you might also be able to provide some information on uh, Pyxis planicata. Well, um, regarding Planicotto, we we do have a, a small captive population of those at our facility in uh, in Tana. Um, years ago, Planicotto was prioritized as one of the most endangered tortoises in Madagascar, and it's kind of fallen off the charts because the uh, the it just has not been it's not it, it, they're harder to find than the spider tortoises. The spider tortoises are very obvious in their habitat, and when you get into good habitat. I can remember early trips there where you could just find, you know, hundreds of these in a day. Uh, and those days are gone, of course. Uh, a lot of populations are tapped out, but there's still, um, I mean, you still can find them. Um, but it's, um, 
it's, it's nowhere near where it was. Um, so it's really important that we have uh, captive programs for these, both XC2 and NC2. And we and the TSA currently maintains uh, captive programs for all three subspecies. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, almost all of the populations of the three subspecies reside outside of currently protected areas, uh, except for those such as at uh, Cap Saint Marie. This is true. Yep. Okay, so a, a tortoise that it has threats from multiple levels, uh, multiple fronts, and really not very many places to quote unquote hide. Yep. All right. So next, um, our actions for spider tortoises. And of course, there is that extremely handsome gentleman, Rick Hudson, uh, staring lovingly into the chocolate brown eyes of a spider tortoise. Um, so the TSA receives, treats, and rehabilitates specimens confiscated from illicit trade. Uh, we maintain assurance colonies of over 100 specimens for each of the three subspecies. Uh, the TSA produces offspring uh, of all three subspecies through captive breeding of these assurance colonies. And the TSA facilitates ground level research, field levels, and data analysis for the subspecies. And I love it. Rick, you'll love this. Michael Ogle finally chimed in saying, Pixis are the best. Uh, for all of you out there who don't know Michael Ogle, uh, who is the curator of herpetology at Zoo Knoxville. Um, he, he is what we would call a Pixis uh, hoarder, okay? Uh, I, I think the guy needs to go to uh, see some sort of uh, therapist on his Pixis obsession. Now, then again, the same could see, be said about me for Dimeback Terrapins and about Rick Hudson for Radiated Tortoises. So uh, who am I to judge? But either way, the uh, Zoo Knoxville and Michael Ogle and uh, Stephen Nelson and others are, are doing wonderful things for um, um, not only performing, but learning more about the captive reproduction of uh, the uh, Pixis uh, genre. So I want to give great. a shout out to uh, Ryan Walker as well. Ryan was the one that really did a lot of the early field work on, on all three of the three, four Pixis and and is responsible largely for what we know about the gaps in distribution and the status of these of these uh, of these species. And Ryan Ryan was uh, for somebody that's allergic to sun, uh, he did an amazing job uh, gutting it out and working in the south. He's a tenacious biologist, and we're really proud to have supported his work. Yeah, I remember I remember uh, seeing his presentation and chatting with him at the 2012. Uh, symposium in Tucson, Arizona. And uh, yeah, I mean, just, just you know, and going back and reading about those assessments, uh, because you're talking about just large swaths of land, uh, uh, very sunny, as you said, uh, mm -hmm. extremely arid uh, and windswept, uh, thorns everywhere. And at the same time, you're looking for a six inch tortoise who just so happens to have a web-like pattern on its shell blending in with everything around it. So yeah, absolutely, uh, you know, drinks up and hats off to, to his work there. All right, uh, moving on to the radiated tortoise. We've already talked, talked much about this tortoise, um, probably the most well-known uh, and well-publicized tortoise of Madagascar, but it is one that we have seen a systematic extirpation of. Uh, Rick, I think you would agree with this. This is uh, the American bison story or buffalo of Madagascar. Uh, there are many other species around the world who we could uh, create a simil similar analogy for. Uh, but just for all of those uh, watching, uh, the American bison once uh, roamed across uh, much of the North American continent. Uh, they, their range spread all the way from California in the west um, up into New England uh, in, in the far 
east and then um, uh, uh, substantially north into Canada and then south into Texas and Florida. What I'm trying to say is the animal was everywhere. Um, it, it, it's, its population uh, was estimated at uh, a, a conservative estimate of 80 million animals. So you're talking about something that not only dominated, but had an extremely important role in the ecological processes uh, of ecosystems. Um, but um, as the story goes, uh, the American bison was uh, uh, obliterated, we'll say, um, by hunters in uh, the 19th uh, century. Uh, they were uh, basically went through a systematic uh, extermination for their hides and for trophies. And um, by the turn of the 20th century, uh, there was uh, just over 1,000 bison left. Um, and what we're seeing in Madagascar is very synonymous to this. Uh, an animal that once uh, had populations estimated uh, at at least 12 million, if not more animals. Uh, this, uh, the radiated tortoise was once uh, one of the most common and densely populated tortoises on earth. Um, and now uh, the, the population uh, has been uh, reduced by at least 75%. And we're talking about uh, in only a matter of three decades. So as Rick was saying, the trajectory of this uh, tortoise towards extinction is what lends to its critically endangered status. And uh, unless we as a collective community do something and continue to do something and fight hard for its conservation and preservation, uh, this, this species could very well be functionally extinct in the wild within the next 20 years. Uh, a, a prospect that uh, should make any animal lover uh, extremely sad inside about. Um, their population, like we talked about for Pyxis, uh, highly due to deforestation for charcoal harvesting, slash and burn agriculture and livestock conversion, uh, and as we've already talked about, collection for the food and pet traits. Uh, there is an annual estimated take, uh, and I want to stress that word take because it is taking this animal from its natural home, uh, from its uh, 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 ecosystem, and from its country of origin for the international pet trade and food trade, and that is estimated at over 50,000 tortoises per year, an absolutely shocking and uh, uh, um, uh, I'm just going to say it's just terrible. It's heartbreaking. Uh, the poaching uh, rate for this species is 25 times greater uh, than what would be predicted for a sustainable harvest of the animal. And overall, uh, it has seen a greater than 65% contraction of its historic range. Uh, Rick, anything you'd like to add about this? Because we all know this is your favorite turtle species on Earth. Well, this, you know, this this is a battle that I know we can win. We, we've 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 gotten there in time. We we can win this this battle. Uh, we're going to have to do a lot of work at the community level because that's where the battle will be won or lost. It's at the community level. But this it's it certainly underscores the importance of these captive populations that we're holding that are confiscated. Uh, and being rehabilitated because those offer the, the, the opportunity to recover uh, populations that have been poached out. So, you know, the, the 24,000 tortoises we're holding really are uh, provide provide the key to re recovering some of these depleted populations. But as I said, this is a battle we can can win. It's a, it's something I'm committed to. I'm not uh, I can't retire until I know that this species is secure. So. Uh, I may be with y'all for a while. Well, Rick, you have to retire at some point so that I can become president. 
You can <laughs> <laughs> just leave me mad again. <laughs> um, so uh, Danico asks, and this is a good one for you, Rick. Can we train the tribes to help the tortoise breed and protect them in the native range of habitats and fund the tribes with paid tourist guides uh, uh, specifically for the tortoises? There's a trial project going on in the Southwest now that is that hopes to do exactly that. They want to protect nesting females, uh, harvest the juveniles, raise them to a certain size where they can be uh, released, and and it it gives it provides economic incentive for the communities to keep tortoises there because there it generates tourism dollars and potentially generates uh, income from. Uh, sale of these tortoises if they can be designated appendix two, which would then open them up for commercial trade. Uh, that's we have a long way to go before that can happen, but uh, there's a model for that uh, working in uh, in Mauritius now. Uh, one of our colleagues is breeding radiated tortoises that are, can be commercially traded because they're his facility has been designated as a, de a legitimate captive breeding facility. So the animals drop from appendix one to two, which means they can engage in commerce. Uh, that's a model we really need to, I think, uh, follow. Um, we need to look closely at that. There's a lot of potential for abuse uh, if a system, if the system is not managed properly, but um, we need to keep looking at that because communities, if the communities don't get some incentive, there's not much hope. Right. Yeah, it would have to be a very, very carefully thought out process. And even if it became implemented, having the ability to uh, adapt and evolve uh, as problems arise. Because as we know, uh, looking at species who are already captive bred in heavy numbers, uh, many are still collected from the wild um, to whether it's uh, bring in new bloodlines uh, or to bring in adult specimens uh, to create uh, rapid breeding, breeding groups instead of raising captive bred individuals. Uh, and then also, uh, the, you know, passing off captive bred individual or wild caught individuals as captive bred, uh, which is a, co a problem we already see now with species that are allowed to be traded. So uh, something that, yeah, we very much need to look at carefully, but as you said, uh, we need to, in the long run, incentivize these communities, uh, for the animals protection. And that community incentive takes many forms. I mean, we have done things from examples of we, you know, building schools in communities. Uh, we provide, uh, have built wells and tapped into a central water pipeline from the river to provide water to these communities. There's many ways you can incentivize communities, and that's just something we're starting to scratch the surface on. We have two community engagement professionals that, that work for us now uh, that will be working at our reintroduction sites. And we, we fortunately, the radiated tortoise will never go extinct because of good captive breeding programs, but I think that you know, I would hate to think that there's a, ever a day that we couldn't go to Madagascar and drive down the road in the morning and see, you know, get out and move tortoises off the road. I just, I don't want to live in a world that, with that grim future. Thank you, Rick. Uh, uh, Dick was just saying there's an audio technical problem and echo of everything Jordan's saying is going on continually. Um, and and that can happen. The thing is, is when streaming, uh, there's going to be time delays. Where, you know, even if that's just by a fraction of a second, and then streaming through a third-party platform uh, to YouTube, um, uh, because of those uh, echoes, can be uh, created uh, just due to that minute time delay. So that might be what it is. Hopefully, that's all it is. Um, hopefully it's not Rick just whispering what I'm saying out loud to himself. Oh, wow. Now I'm really getting it. Well, so Emily says, I don't have the problem on my end. Mark says uh, communities are key to the solution. And 
Andrew Wald says, I have this problem with Jordan Daly. I tell you what, that Andrew Wald, how do you please the guy? Um, well, I think we know that answer. Um, all right, so action for radiated tortoises. So the TSA uh, receives, treats, and rehabilitates specimens confiscated from illicit trade. Uh, we currently maintain over 24,500 radiated tortoises across our facilities. Uh, that is an absolutely staggering amount of animals to care for, to provide them security, to provide them water, to provide them uh, food, um, and do life support checks on a daily basis. Uh, as, you, as you can all imagine, uh, uh, creating those enclosures, uh, which are vast enclosures built into native spiny forest habitat, and keeping up with the tortoises hungry mouths is a, a large financial burden uh, uh, for any organization, let alone a conservation nonprofit. Um, it, just so you all get an idea, um, we have to feed the tortoises nearly 12,000 kilograms of uh, leafy greens uh, per month. Um, so that is an, ex an exorbitant amount of food. Uh, now, uh, adding to that, however, is one of the programs that we have to incentivize the communities for the tortoises protection is that in the communities uh, surrounding our tortoise centers, we have developed um, uh, a system whereby we purchase uh, agricultural products uh, grown by the communities for the tortoises. So this is, uh, this is a, a perfect uh, positive feedback loop uh, whereby the tortoises get fed, uh, the communities uh, have a source of income. And that's how we really need to model these, uh, these conservation efforts. And, and not just for the tortoises in captivity, but also for uh, tortoises living out in the wild is uh, creating um, sustainable uh, livelihoods and sustainable alternative livelihoods uh, and better land management and uh, water management practices um, so that uh, the, the communities are empowered um, for their own subsistence um, and don't rely on whether it be the tortoises or products from their habitat uh, as greatly. Um, yeah, you want to say something, Rick? Feel free. I want to give a shout out to our partner, ZooMed, uh, while we're talking about tortoise food, who has sent over um, 40 buckets of their tortoise chow, grassland tortoise chow, which we will use as supplements at our at our facilities. Um, you know, we, we're feeding, I think, enough food, but I don't know that it, if the nutritional value of some of what we're feeding is is adequate. So this, the, the diet they've sent is going to be a great supplement for, for our tortoises and ZooMed is committed to uh, to shipping that tortoise food at least three times per year, um, and so we. I just want to give a shout out to, to that. To, that that really helps us sustain this program is is getting support like that from our partners. So thank you, Gary Bagnell and ZooMed. Can't tell you how much we appreciate this. Yeah, absolutely. And and for those of you who follow us on social media, which should be every one of you. Um, we will, we will have the photo up shortly of that uh, most recent shipment of tortoise food uh, from Zoo Med. It will make any tortoise keeper pass out just thinking about that amount of food uh, donated for the tortoises. Uh, and then of course, uh, a wonderful picture of a radiated tortoise already taking fast advantage of that donation. So yes, thank you very much Zoo Med. Uh, and thank you to all the communities uh, who help support the programs in Madagascar uh, with relation to uh, food sustenance for the tortoises. Uh, and then uh, also TSA produces educational information for communities and schools. 
as we know, educational outreach and inspiring and creating catalytic moments for the next generation of uh, humans everywhere, and especially for that uh, ever-growing population of Malagasy. Uh, education is such an important tool uh, for conservation. Uh, another thing I want to say is that the TSA works with the Malagasy government, NGOs, nonprofits, and law enforcement to reduce poaching, increase law enforcement, and prosecute smugglers. Uh, we have some questions coming in. Uh, Danico asks another question. Is there any plants that any Madagascar tortoise have evolved to eat and are essential for the tortoise? And are, the, are, there plant, and are these plants endangered uh, and need uh, growing and propagating? I mean, the tortoises are relatively opportunistic foragers, but they do have uh, a, a preference for certain types of plants. Uh, Rick, what would you comment on this? Well, we have, a, you know, through dietary analysis, through, through um, some of our research colleagues over the years, we've got an extensive list of, of what radiated tortoises eat. Uh, I don't know if many of those species are endangered or not. I don't have the list in front of me, but uh, we do cultivate some of those species on site. Um, you know, the, the, we, we collect a lot of wild browse as well. I mean, we're not just feeding sweet potato vine and, and, and a puntia. We're collecting wild native food plants, trying to give them as diverse a diet as possible. Uh, but I don't have that list in front of me, but I can certainly um, get it. When we had... Um, we did workshops back in 2012 and we sent people out to observe tortoises and see what they were eating and to collect those plants. Um, and it was a really good exercise, but it's um, just trying to get people to think about the diversity of plant species that, that radiated tortoises eat. But then again, you take them, you know, where they're, where they're living in, in very degraded habitat that's dominated by a puntia, they're not getting that diversity. We don't really know how a, Tortoises feeding on a diet of a punty a long term is going to affect their reproductive health, their output. We just don't know. We, we know they're subsisting on it, but we don't know uh, if there's any health impacts. Um, so diversity is best if we can do it. That's what we strive for. All right. Thanks a lot, Rick. Uh, by the way, we just passed the two minute, uh, the two, two minute. Yeah, right. You all wish the two hour mark. So this has been our longest webinar so far. But again, uh, whether you have stayed the whole time, which thank you very much, or whether you have to leave and then come back and watch, always remember it's available, archived on our YouTube channel. Uh, and that also archives the entire live chat board. So you can go back and see and respond to any discussions in the future. Uh, but again, we feel Madagascar uh, deserves this extensive webinar. All right, let's talk about DINA. Uh, this is an application of community standards. Um, and this is a bottom-up community-based law that reinforces the cultural tradition for protecting the tortoises. Uh, in 2012, uh, in the region of Andrui, uh, the, uh, the DINA was officially adopted as Lelenton y Andrui. Um, and this is closely tied to the fatty, the taboo of eating tortoises practiced by the Mahafali and uh, Tandrui people. Um, it has been well received by communities uh, who want to protect their cultural traditions as well as the tortoises. Um, if you look at the picture there, something that I want to bring up uh, is that part of uh, implementing the DINA uh, uh, when there is an offense, and the offense would be uh, smuggling, uh, poaching, or uh, slaughtering tortoises, um, would be that the community uh, involving those apprehended uh, must come together um, and they must consecrate uh, the ground with the blood of a zebu. 
And as Rick talked about before, uh, in these rural areas of uh, South uh, South Madagascar, uh, the zebu is a uh, a primary form of wealth for these people, these families, and these communities. Uh, so uh, to purchase a zebu for slaughter uh, to consecrate and commemorate uh, the event uh, comes at great cost to uh, uh, those apprehended and to their communities. And this uh, should act as a deterrent um, for uh, future tortoise poaching. Um, and, and, and this, I, I, I've seen uh, this uh, Dina um, implemented by Harry Lala uh, Randria Mahazu, uh, who is the director uh, also our chief law enforcement officer, uh, Sylvain, um, uh, who is primarily responsible uh, for implementing the DINA. Um, you know, this is a way it's, it's, you know, you can think of it as public shaming, uh, but it's more public education and uh, bringing uh, everybody together in this community to say that DINA is law, that uh, we are fighting for the protection and preservation of these tortoises, and we are fighting for the protection and preservation of culture in these areas. What it effectively does is, is if you have a couple of bad actors in a community that are poaching tortoises or, or that are allowing poaching to go on uh, and they get caught, it collectively punishes the whole community. So, um, it, it, it creates kind of this pressure for the community to self-regulate and self-enforce so there are no bad actors. Because if, if two people are engaging in bad activity and they're caught, the whole community who tolerated it and witnessed it and observed it and didn't report it collectively are punished. And so it's a, it's a very effective mechanism. Sylvan is the, uh, Sylvan Mazahote, our enforcement officer, is the guy that really understands how to implement and apply this DINA and it's it's often a lot of intense negotiations, but the community has to agree to the to give up a zebu, which is no small amount of money to them. Right. All right. Next, let's talk about law enforcement keeping poachers off balance and on the run. Um, as you can imagine, uh, uh, synonymous uh, with uh, tortoise poaching is uh, tortoise law enforcement activities. And over the past several years, that law enforcement has continued to grow in breadth and in strength. Um, and now we are seeing uh, a greater numbers of poachers arrested and indicted and harsher sentences uh, being um, uh, put down for uh, those Criminal uh, criminals apprehended. Um, so the TSA's law enforcement team, as we said, and informant network is led by Sylvan Mahazatuhai, um, and has contributed to the arrest of numerous tortoise poachers and traffickers. Uh, just in the last several years alone, over 100 suspects have been arrested to date. So. Um, hats off to Sil uh, Sylvain and his team, uh, who they, they are putting themselves in harm's way. Uh, they are living a dangerous lifestyle, uh, infiltrating these poaching networks. Um, but they are also very deeply respected uh, in the communities in which they perform their work. Because again, their law enforcement is helping to preserve traditions and customs that have been a part of those communities for millennia. Um, Sivan is the key enforcement officer administ administering uh, the DINA implementation. And the TSA works closely with the Ministry of Environment and Forests and the Regional Director of Environmental Environment and Forests as well as local law enforcement officers. And uh, with that being said, I have to give a big shout out to uh, my friend and our close companion of the TSA, uh, Suari, 
Uh, Suwari is the uh, director of forests uh, and environment for the Atsimu Andrafana region. And she has been so instrumental in, um, in heightening the uh, level of action uh, of law enforcement for the tortoises of that region. And she has been very instrumental in some of the very large uh, confiscations uh, that have occurred over the last several years. So uh, hello, Suari, if you are watching. Uh, we love you from the TSA and thank you so much for your tireless efforts on behalf of tortoises. Uh, Rick, is there anything you'd like to say about law enforcement? You know, we kind of we're at the point where we're kind of play a cat and mouse game with the uh, the large poachers that we we know who they are when they come in from Tulier into the core part of the range. We're able to pick them up through our informant network. We know where they are. We know where they're working, where they're putting out orders for tortoises. And we put pressure on them. We start observing them and making sure that they are constantly off balance and under pressure. And um, it, I think it's been an effective deterrent because because of our informant network, we know where they're working, when they're in the area, and we can inter, interdict and intercept them or at least uh, make them feel uncomfortable. So right. hat, hats off to Sylvain. The man is uh, absolutely fearless in confronting poachers. Um, he's He's tenacious. I don't know how he does it. Yeah, I don't even want Sylvan coming to my house and asking me about the turtles I own. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, Sylvan, I would, I would love to have you as a guest. Um, uh, which brings us then to the big one. Uh, this is a story that swept around the world. It's directly tied to law enforcement. It's directly tied to the regions we've talked about, uh, the, uh, the problems with poverty, international smuggling, all of it um, is the big one, the historic seizure of 2018. I think Rick and I, uh, and those from our Madagascar program who are still watching, um, can, can we all remember uh, the morning of April 10th, 20, uh, I put 2019, that was an accident, 2018. Uh, of, of 2018. Um, Harry Lala had, uh, had sent an email uh, saying that there was a major tortoise confiscation. Um, he, he, and he, he estimated around 5,000 individuals. And I re immediately re uh, remember texting Rick and being like, I is this accurate? Did you get Harry Lala's email? Um, and even in Harry Lala's original correspondence, he, he questioned that number. And the reason being is there had never been a confiscation of this magnitude, uh, even 5,000 individuals. Most confiscations uh, number in the hundreds, uh, if not maybe a thousand uh, some individuals. Um, so to see, to, to hear of numbers even as high as 5,000 would be abnormal because that would uh, signify the stockpiling of tortoises as opposed to uh, you know, holding them in, in various different uh, camps for their uh, smuggling out of the country. Uh, well, as the day progressed, Harry Lala updated us that uh, Suwari uh, and other members of the uh, DRED, uh, at the time it was DREF, um, we're on the ground counting tortoises by the time the night was over. And um, imagine this operation. Uh, they counted 10,308 radiated tortoises uh, uh, confiscated from one household in Tuliar, Madagascar on the southwest coast. Uh, if you look at the top picture there, you will see uh, that is just one room. Uh, with radiated tortoises. So now imagine a two-story house with numerous bedrooms, bathrooms, kitchens, closets, and every single inch of space. And you all can go back on our social media or on our blog and, and relive the experience. Uh, uh, watch those YouTube videos I suggested. Uh, just think about every single square inch of space 
being covered in radiated tortoises. It was a sight that Suwari uh, had never even imagined could happen, uh, nor could believe with her own eyes or her own nose. Uh, these tortoises were being held for, uh, most likely they had spent months in transit to this location and then a unknown amount of time stockpiled at this um, point uh, in which, uh, uh, as far as we know, a Chinese shipping vessel uh, was uh, on its way uh, to the coast to pick up this consignment of tortoises. Um, and as I say, uh, had, had uh, law enforcement not taken action in Suwari, not uh, assist law enforcement, these tortoises would have eventually, uh, effectively vanished into the night. Uh, we would never have known of their leaving Madagascar and they would have entered, ended up in the black market trade. Uh, what's really sad about that statement is to think about the number of tortoises that do leave uh, their homeland of Madagascar that we are not able to uh, rescue and uh, potentially return to their homeland. Uh, okay, so moving on, if you remember at the beginning of this webinar, we talked about the Village des Tortues, a SOPTOM uh, facility uh, just north of Tuliar. Uh, well, uh, the tortoises were all originally transferred to Village des Tortues, uh, which, would, which would become um, the home base for the subsequent rescue and rehabilitation effort. And this truly became a global rescue effort. Um, over the course of three months, 75 men and women, including veterinarians, veteran, veterinary technicians, uh, tortoise caretakers, epidemiologists, um, um, uh, communications uh, experts, videographers, photographers, um, I mean, the list goes on about the backgrounds of people all coming uh, with, a, uh, with a unified goal to help these tortoises. Um, and that, so the total was over 70 organizations and 500 individual donors uh, stepped up and supported this global relief effort. And we cannot thank all those people enough. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, just about 9,000 of those 10,308 tortoises survived um, this uh, harrowing and traumatic, um, but inspiring experience. Um, and so all of that effort um, led to uh, just under 90% uh, uh, survival rate for those tortoises that were seized. Um, had, had these teams not gone to Madagascar uh, and assisted uh, Niaina and the other veterinarians from TSA Madagascar, as well as uh, Natasha Rasuluzaka uh, from Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust and those at uh, Saptam's Village de, de Tortue, uh, we would have seen a, uh, a death toll in the thousands. So all I can say there is thank you. Um, now, uh, those tortoises, the surviving members, uh, well over 8,000 individuals uh, reside in safety at the TSA's Lava Vulu Tortoise Center. Um, now, one thing I do want to note as a big thanks to all those who provided effort in, the, in, in this other arena uh, was that the Lava Vulu Tortoise Center was a relatively small facility uh, uh, for tortoises confiscated in the Southwest. Uh, as a result of this confiscation and the need to rapidly expand a facility to intake this many tortoises, um, as well as due, uh, due to the support of the global community, uh, we were able uh, to create um, a, a large tortoise sanctuary uh, basically, a, you know, you can call it a refugee camp if you want, uh, where the tortoises receive food, water, daily care, and security 
until hopefully they are able to go back into the wild. And look, I've, I, have, I have hundreds, if not thousands of photos from this operation. If you want to watch this operation in greater detail, uh, see more video and footage, uh, please go to the YouTube uh, video um, uh, crisis in Madagascar, as well as saving the radio tortoise. And of course, you can always go back through our TSA blogs and social media to see the, uh, you know, all the pictures from the effort. But uh, you have Team Radiata 1. This was the uh, first team of um, global wildlife warriors descending upon um uh, upon Ifati Mangili uh, to provide uh, relief to the tortoises uh, as counterparts uh, to uh, SOPTOM, uh, TSA Madagascar, and Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust's uh, members who were already there on the ground. Um, feeding time for the tortoises was no small endeavor. They were fed twice per day. So you're talking about uh, uh, tens of thousands of kilograms of food over the course of that effort. Um, of course, each, uh, each tortoise uh, re uh, received morning inspection every day. So again, uh, imagine our teams on their hands and knees giving life checks to every single of roughly 10,000 tortoises per morning. Uh, and then the veterinary effort that went into this was something that one cannot even dream of. There's not even words for it. Uh, over 6,000 medical procedures were performed by, uh, by the medical team led by Dr. Uh, Bonnie Raphael of the uh, Wildlife Conservation Society and uh, Bon Bon uh, Veterinary Care. Um, and then all the other veterinary technicians and uh, veterinarians that uh, came and provided care as well. Um, in the end, if you look there on the right, I like to call that the Great Wall of Tortoises. That is just one small glimpse of the new facility uh, built in Lava Vulu as a response to this confiscation. Look at that endless wall going into the spiny forest. Um, so now here resides um, uh, over 15,000 tortoises, uh, and that is because only six months after the big one was the next one. Uh, that's right. In October of 2018, uh, in the uh, Atsimu Andrafana region, there was another stockpiling and confiscation of tortoises, this time 7,338 tortoises were seized and uh, were given on the ground treatment. And then those tortoise, that tortoise consignment uh, divided between uh, Village de Tortu and the Lavu, Lava Vulu Tortoise Center. Um, so for their hopeful uh, release back into the wild. And that gets us to the confiscation to reintroduction strategy. And I'm gonna let Rick really take this over um, so this strategy focuses on evaluating three key components, and it's a strategy that has uh, was devised uh, several years ago. It continues to evolve based on the circumstances in Madagascar, all of which we have talked about already. Uh, but the first step is it relies on community engagement uh, as uh, following that habitat condition and then poacher accessibility. Uh, also a combination of intense ground truthing, GIS mapping, and a multitude of follow-up surveys will allow us to key in on remote sites with the highest potential for successful reintroduction. Okay, keeping uh, uh, well over 24,000 tortoises in our centers, and then uh, over 5,000 tortoises at the Village de Tortu is a monumental task. It's a Herculean effort, and it is one that is not sustainable. Uh, and on top of that, we want to 
uh, conserve these animals in the wild. And so we look at this reintroduction strategy as a way of returning uh, a part of Madagascar's natural history. Um, so the local community involvement and engagement is the most important aspect of this project. And ultimately, our success will depend upon the willingness uh, of the local people to protect the tortoises. Uh, as part of this effort, the goal is to establish large, uh, approximately one to two hectare uh, uh, pre-release soft enclosures in each site selected. And this will allow the tortoises to acclimate to their new habitat and surroundings for a period of roughly one year uh, before the walls of the soft release enclosure are taken down and the tortoises can uh, naturally enter the surrounding forest and uh, establish their new home ranges. So Rick, this is a project that is near and dear to your heart. You have spent so much time uh, researching and creating on this strategy, and I would love to give you the platform here to talk about it. Well, I want to back up just a little bit and talk about the big confiscations of 2018. And I, I think those, our response to those uh, confiscations were certainly TSA's finest moment. And, and everybody that was a part of it, I think will, you know, go to their graves with fond memories of, of that, of that event. Uh, it was, uh, it's just something you don't forget. Um, what allowed our effective response was our close working relationship with the zoo communities, both in North America, uh, AZA community, as, as well as in Europe. And so we were able to mobilize a lot of zoo personnel that came there, uh, paid for by their hosting zoos. Um, and, you know, the veterinary, the veterinary community came together. Um, it's just something that zoos are uniquely positioned to do. We've had, we zoos have the resources to deal with this stuff and have been doing it for years. So mobilizing that community is really what gave a lot of punch, I think, to TSA's effort. The other thing that's changed in this is, you know, we were kind of in a free fall panic mode, you know, after two big confiscations in 2018, it's like, you know, we can't keep building facilities. We cannot keep taking in all these tortoises. And fortunately, we haven't, and we haven't seen uh, the large stockpile of tortoises since then. And, and what what has changed, uh, we think, is that at the time of those confiscations, there were multiple, multiple Chinese fishing ve vessels working offshore, especially in the south. I mean, I've, you could sit there and, and in the evening and see those vessels uh, mm -hmm. fishing. And so that provided an easy access. If we can get tortoises offshore to those fishing vessels, they can get to international waters, and then we offload. They offload the tortoises. Um, we had they have you know probably I think tired of trying to get tortoises out of the airport because we've intercepted so many. So it was just easy to stockpile tortoises and then move them to those Chinese fishing vessels. When those fishing contracts were canceled, the uh, the the Chinese moved out, and so we I think that's what's is behind the fact that we haven't seen any large confiscations since. But you, we would talk about the confiscation and reintroduction strategy. You know, we realized early on that taking tortoises that were freshly confiscated and then taking them out and releasing was, was not a good strategy. These tortoises are essentially lost. They don't know where they are. They're disoriented. They just wander and they wander out of the protected areas. We did some uh, research in terms of determining that a soft released strategy is what we wanted to employ, and that's that's where we are. That's where we are. Um, but selection of the reintroduction sites is really key, and you know we, a lot of factors go into the evaluation of of those sites. And it's the attitudes of the community, the condition of the habitat, the status of the resident tortoise population. Is it depleted or is it healthy? If it's healthy, you don't want to put tortoises back in there. So there's a, a whole range of, uh, we have a whole checklist of uh, a scorecard, if you will, to evaluate habitat and its uh, and rank its potential for a reintroduction site. And so based on that, we have narrowed it down to two, two, two sites that will receive a thousand tortoises uh, each uh, starting in well, we intended to start this uh, late 2020. Um, the COVID pandemic hit, and so everything has been delayed. But we 
uh, fully intend to get back on target, hopefully in 2021 and start this reintroduction process. Uh, once we are successfully able to demonstrate that uh, those 1,000 tortoises are I think they will in terms of protecting them, then we can expand and really step that effort at reintroduction up. So that's, that's where we are. We're going to be using drone technology to, to survey potential release sites, uh, working with local communities. We've, we've got a lot of support from the AZA community, the AZA SAFE program in terms of giving us grants to uh, facilitate this reintroduction. A lot of organizations have contributed to seeing that this reintroduction strategy is, 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 is implemented. Um, so um, we look forward to getting back to work on this and as soon as the travel bans are lifted. Back to you, Jordan. Uh, a couple of questions came in while you're providing that excellent information. Uh, one was uh, regarding genetics. Well, well, if these tortoises that are selected for pre-release um, uh, will be released based on genetic testing of local populations, or if they're all just considered radiata and so then released into areas uh, that we feel they will be most protected um, with, with uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess a genetics aside. Years ago, uh, a student of Ed Lewis from Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo and Madagascar Biodiversity Partnership, his name, um, his, he's Canadian, his name escapes me now, Sebastian something, did the population genetics throughout the range of radiated tortoises. And though they did find some population structure based on the presence of rivers isolating certain populations, um, there was some genetic structure. But in conversations with Ed subsequently, he said it's not enough structure there to justify um, doing genetic analysis every time you're going to do a reintroduction. I mean, it's it's it don't let that hold you back. In other words, um, it's it's not there's not enough structure there to uh, to um, to pay attention to. And these rivers that uh, provide, that, that, is, that not isolate, but that divide segments of the radiated tortoises range, you know, frequently go dry. So they're not really effective barriers. They are during the wet season, but then during the dry season, they are not. So um, the bottom line is we don't have enough population structure to be, to let that be a concern. All right, excellent. Uh, uh, Fena Fenaritra, uh, Randria Mahazo asks, what is the most difficult challenge that TSA has, has to face for rescuing these radiated turtles in Madagascar? Um, and I think a lot of that is what we've talked about through the webinar, but is, is, there, is there one focal point that you, Rick, would, would prioritize as the most challenging aspect? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's caring for them long term. I mean, once you take these tortoises on it, 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 it as, an, as a short term rescue, it, 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 it then becomes a long term program until you can effectively devise a strategy to get them back out into the wild. And so you end up taking care of them long term, which, um, you know, finding food to feed that many tortoises is a huge challenge. The staff it takes to, to take care of the tortoises as well as to protect them. Um, the building facilities, transportation, water isn't always an issue. We're having to dig wells at, uh, at numerous facilities. So there's just a, you know, just the, the inherent uh, cost associated with caring for this many tortoises, which we never, ever dreamed we would ever see this many tortoises under our care. We, we just, it, it blew up in our face in 2018 and we kind of live with uh, in quiet desperation, just hoping that <laughs> that never happens again. I think that's time for a shameless plug from me to say, become a TSA member, become a TSA uh, sustained donor and help save these tortoises. I'm not afraid to be uh, shameless. Um, I, I love this. Uh, Danico says he wishes this live stream was shown on nationwide TV uh, so that the masses could watch. Thank you very much, Danico. That's, that's really nice feedback. Uh, Devin Edmonds asks, will local communities be involved in monitoring the tortoises at reintroduction sites? Is there room to provide income through long-term monitoring efforts by community members? 
Yes and yes. The communities that are targeted for the reintroduction, the staff will be trained to not only um, do observations in the field and take GPS readings when they find a tortoise, but also to, to, to track tortoises. Some of these tortoises will be equipped with radio transmitters. All will have GPS trackers. So if, if they're not effectively tracked or if people aren't following them as rigorously as they should, at the end of the project, we can take the GPS trackers off and we've got a good uh, idea of how far they're moving. Uh, so once we analyze all that data, we'll have a clear idea whether our, our soft release strategy has worked. But yes, uh, the, the local communities will be incentivized and paid and trained to, uh, to monitor these tortoises. Um, and we've all, we're also doing, um, two of the communities we're going to be working at have expressed interest in uh, getting their community forest as gazetted as, as a community protected area. Uh, and right now they don't feel that, that they that people couldn't come in and take their forests, collect their resources, and they don't have the any illegal document to protect their forests. And so we're uh, helping them, um, or have committed to helping them uh, go through the legal process of getting those forests protected for their benefit. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, Rick. It, it just you know shows how important the communities are to preserving uh, their natural heritage, um, in, you know, in concert with the, the TSA's uh, focus of preserving these animals. Oh, and by the way, Rick, the, uh, the human database himself, Peter Paul, uh, says that that was Sebastian Rio uh, Paquette. Rio. Paquette, that's right. Yep. Yep, there we go. So thank you, Peter Paul. Always, it's always wonderful to have Peter Paul on these webinars. Because um, yeah, anytime I stumble, he raised me up so I can walk on mountains. His, his memory's working a lot better than mine. <laughs> all right. So with all of that being said, um, I want to thank you all very much. Uh, those who have stayed those who have come and gone, those who will view this webinar in the future, and especially those who just love turtles and tortoises and work for their preservation. Uh, in acknowledgement of all the organizations, zoological institutions, companies, communities, citizens, individual donors, and especially our TSA Madagascar staff who are there every day, 24-7, 365, working to preserve these animals um, and these projects. Uh, I know I and, and Rick and the TSA, we cannot uh, overstate our most sincere appreciation. Um, really, as I state here, because of you, the tortoises of Madagascar have a chance at survival. So thank you very much. Thank you for all, uh, all the commentary and, uh, and, and chatter between everyone in the live chat has been wonderful. The questions have been wonderful. Uh, Danico says, exciting BBC, BBC documentary needed. Uh, I agree if you know of anybody at BBC or if anyone does who would like to focus on a documentary of the plight of the tortoises of Madagascar, please reach out to us. Uh, and of course, I want to thank uh, Rick Hudson, um, not only for, uh, you know, uh, uh, his own mentorship uh, of uh, my time in the TSA, uh, his, you know, his founding of this program with Harry Lala in Madagascar, but uh, uh, for those of you watching, you know, uh, turtle and tortoise conservation uh, in this world as we know it would not be what it is right now without Rick Hudson. So, I want to thank Rick very much for being on the webinar today and providing just so much uh, in-depth and personal information. And thank you to all of our TSA Madagascar staff who have been watching and um, uh, giving their own uh, personal information from the ground there. We love you all. Thank you, Jordan. And thanks everybody for tuning in. And just, we need your support now more than ever with the, with the pandemic shutdown. Uh, it's 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 going to be a tough year for us uh, financially, and so we uh, 
we need your support more than ever. But thanks for listening in, and we uh, we love uh, we love doing what we do. That we do. Um, so um, please tune in for our next webinar. Uh, be on the lookout for that promotion where we will now travel from uh, Madagascar to India, where we also have a very large and very complex program in this uh, third most turtle rich country on earth. It is not something you're gonna wanna miss. Uh, we'll try not to make it uh, two and a half hours, but again, uh, every one of these country programs uh, deserves uh, to be uh, uh, well, um, well, you know, the work to be well disseminated. So thank you all very much. And uh, we will see you next time. Have a great day. And turtle knowledge is turtle power. <laughs>